Hello and welcome to the Hustle Over Everything podcast. This is the podcast where you receive stories, tips, and strategies from entrepreneurs to grow your business and take yourself to the next level as a person. I'm Alex. I'm Owen Osende. And today we have Candicia John on the podcast. Candicia is a YouTuber, hair influencer, and event creator. She first started her YouTube channel in 2013 and since has grown to be an influencer on both YouTube and Instagram. She's also copied with big brands like Shea Moisture, Sephora, and more. She's also the creator of Toronto Curly Girl Meetup, an event series educating curly girls on their natural hair. Her IG is Hayes Candicia, and the event page is at Curly Girl Meetup. Oh, what do you think of the pod? I think this was a pod where... You know, one of the things that we always do is we really speak a lot about business, business, business. But I think this is the first time we've had a guest which really showed the other side of being an entrepreneur, right? Our relationships, our life, our things taking a turn here and there. They're not really related to your business, but the cause of them happening affects you and affects everything around you and how you move forward with your business. So it was really awesome just to hear the stories that happened to Candicia and as well how she overcame them and how she's learned to deal with certain personal struggles that come in her way uh, now moving forward in her life. So we really touched upon her business, but the part that I think uh, we're proud of more than anything um, is her speaking about her life and the things that have happened to it to, uh, to it and how it's affected her business and she's moved on forward with it. So she, she gave a lot of great advice on that. Agree. She dived deep into, uh, this some like personal hardships, you know, mm-hmm. she was very candid with us. So I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, we dive deep. Uh, but how are you doing, bro? I'm doing good, man. You know, I'm here in Sarnia. We actually had a, uh, my auntie, she invited us over for drinks and a barbecue last night at her house. So, you know, she hosted our family. Now our fam is hosting today. Uh, so my, my uncle is actually coming down from London and her, my auntie Tagist and my uncle, they're all going to come down today. And um, it's going to be like another family affair this weekend. You know what I'm saying? Just like a, a packed house with food and just laughs and, and, and giggles and whatnot. So it's going to be a good time. And then uh, tomorrow I'm excited, going to hit up the golf course. I, I haven't played in like a week and a half, so I'm itching to play. So i um, going to go get a nice round in. And then, uh, yeah, man, it's going to be a good one. But overall, man, I'm doing good, man. I'm happy. I'm looking forward to coming back to Toronto at the end of the month. And September starts, you know, bro, take it. We haven't actually sat physically with each other in over. So March, April, May, June, July, August. Is that six? Is that close to six months? eh? Yeah, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. It's been a long time. This is that remote work we talk about, bro. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. How about you, man? Um, yo, I've, you been refle- I've been reflecting heavy. You know, yeah, did eh? I tell you the story about uh, the first event I threw? No, no, you didn't tell me that. Bro, one of my boys got uh, borderline jumped. Actually, not even borderline, full, full-blown full jumped um, at gunpoint. Did I tell you about that? No. <laughs> I go, why, why is he getting jumped at gunpoint? Like, what does he have, like, like 50 bands on him or something? No, man. Um, I threw an event. Actually... Before you, this is a, this is a whole story. So, uh, yo, listeners, hustlers, if y'all want to hear this whole story, let us know, and I'll go into the whole detail of exactly how I threw an event, and two people got jumped. Actually, not just my two groups of friends got jumped, mm-hmm. and one of my boys got uh, held up at gunpoint. If y'all want to hear that story, let me know. DM us at twenty four seven hustler, and let me know, uh, and you'll go into it on the next part. Yeah. But yeah, man, it's a hell of a story. I, I maybe I'll tell you offline. Um, but yeah, I was just reflecting on all like the different failures I've had, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and just the lessons from those um, that 
are still pushing me forward to this day. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what's been on my mind as of recently. Um, and it's been a lot. There's been a lot of shit. Because we just were recently on another podcast, and he asked us what our biggest failure was. And I was like, damn, I got a lot, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's, it's something to embrace and just, like, understand, you know. Um, and we're also talking about uh, the difference between the U.S. and Canada in terms of mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is apparent that there is a, a lack of embracing failure here in Canada, whereas in the States it's a little bit more embraced or at least mm-hmm. starting back up, you know. So I was kind of just, like, delving on that a little bit, you know. So, which, yeah. which failure to you really stuck out to you? I, I know you've had a lot of big failures and micro failures, but no matter like the magnitude of the failure, but which one do you think mentally impacted you the most that had allowed you to really move on forward? I got a top five, uh, okay. top five, top five, top five, top five, top, top, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got, I got the uh, failure from Afrotech where, um, I like didn't catch like a like a five figure deal. Um, I is it got, that guy? Is it the guy like we were? Yeah, from he the wanted VIP. to design the VIP guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a crazy one. Um, I got this event one. I got um, what was the other ones I got? What about that that one? Like I think uh, you got hired as I think was it God Style. Was it a- oh yeah, I guess that was a good failure. Yeah, yeah, that was a good yeah. one. Um, I have a lot. Uh, I've, oh, I have a times where I've overspent on on ads, on ad campaigns. You know, um, yeah, I've had a lot of failures. You know, when you're in the in the new stages of of things, there's gonna be failures, there's gonna be fuck ups. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really bracing yourself for that and knowing that um, no one got hurt. It's okay. Mm-hmm. now let's fix it you know being able to have that in the back of your head is so key you know like i remember it's um gary v walking on stage i hate to keep bringing up the gary v but um he walked on and was like today i just lost seven million dollars so just like that they said no the client said no they lost seven million dollars and it was just like super non-romantic about it and it's like yep that just happened and moved forward into his day and i was like damn that's a stomach. Seven mil. Seven mil. Walked out the door. Damn. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, yeah. So it's shit like that that you really got to, gonna have to prepare for. Um, things you're going to have to say no to. Things that, uh, you know, your employees are going to fuck up on your, your, or your freelancers are going to fuck up on and cost you a lot of money. You're going to have to be able to just swallow and be like, all right, that just happened. Yep. Mm. And keep it moving, you know? Yeah, man, it's it's like when you that whole Gary. I I know one of the things that we don't like about bring Gary V a lot is just like we bring him up so much that it just becomes annoying at that point. It's like the our, yeah. it's like a reference point that we can only think about. Yeah, <laughs> you know what exactly. I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah, man, but I think you're you're tried and true, bro. You know, you're hell bent. You know, hell mm-hmm. bent, heaven sent. You know, (laughs) so (laughs) yeah, man, I think failures really make us stronger. And um, without failure, bro, like, I don't think you'll be where you are at today. Like the the level of knowledge, the wisdom, the experience you've gained, it gives you like a certain confidence moving forward that anybody else starting out, they won't really, they'll be timid, but you know what not to do and what to do. And that is visceral. It's built within you to know what not to do and what to do and you can only gain that from experience that's a fact that's a fact so now with that said let's move on to our business tip of the week oh before we move on one thing i want to say i also got a failure of um, messing up a celebrity interview not for us when i have had my first blog way back in the day mm-hmm. i had a whole celebrity interview and then the whole logistics of it went crazy mm-hmm. that's the other story tragic tragic yeah, man. But yeah, let's get into our business tip of the week. So because we have Candice on the podcast, um, I thought we, it would be good to have it centered around influencers. So mm-hmm. um, this one is for people trying to get into influencer marketing. You are a creator um, and not an influencer by Adam Rivet's terms, you know, mm-hmm. um, and you're really trying to say, all right, how can I go get brands now? How can I go get 
business deals to start bringing in revenue for my uh, company. So here's some options. One, if you're an influencer and you're trying to find clients, um, you can start with a influencer brand marketplace, right? A few of those include Hey Influencer, hashtag page, shout out to Adam Rivets. Thank you for coming on the podcast. An easy one that I found is influencer Facebook groups. I've used these personally um, and found some really good influencers there that have actually given sales back to business. You know, um, I had a client once who was interested in this. Um, we found influencers on a Facebook group. We gave them the product, sent them the product. They took like about a week to post it, but they posted it in their own unique way. And we got sales from it and followers on Instagram and the whole nine. So there's a little case study from it. And we sent, we sent them free product um, because their following was still small and their engagement was still small as well. So it was like a good balance between like that beginning relationship. Yeah. So, yeah, Facebook groups is good. Um, a lot of business gets done in Facebook groups. Don't sleep on those. Mm-hmm. Um, the other options, because um, there's a lot of brand to connector places. Like you can just Google it and there's going to be a list that comes up. This depends on your hustle and being able to continuously email multiple brands and get that business done. Another option that's super easy, but this time consuming is DMing. You'd be surprised how many brands are checking their DMs. Because of Instagram's um, API now, they've opened it up to different applications. So brands actually have backend access to Instagram, Instagram um, DM board. So when you DM them, they get sent to a specific backend where they're like, hey, Veronica has to answer this specific DM and they get passed to her and then she has to respond back to you or else she gets in trouble. You know, mm-hmm. so DMs are way more robust now than they used to be. Yeah. So sending DMs to brands can actually uh, result in you getting a business deal. Don't sleep on those. If you have a real following and a real engagement. Um, the other ones that are good, if you have a real following, a real engagement is affiliate marketing. You know, um, we're getting started on this as well. Um, of course, the, the main, main guys out there is Amazon. Um, you can't go wrong there. Um, the only thing is that Amazon has recently cut their affiliate commissions uh, buy a lot of their products if you're a lady in beauty dude you got to be on amazon there's so much opportunity there the commissions is still high and there's a 24 hour window mm-hmm. i believe the commissions are six to seven percent i believe six to seven percent not 67 percent. go ahead I, I gotta tell my sister about that because she's starting her her cosmetics brand right mm-hmm. so she's like before even launching and she's always like posting and sharing a lot of content out there Mm-hmm. I should really put her on the Amazon affiliate for, for beauty. I think she's really going to, and she's not working right now either. So I think she can really take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. The beauty, the beauty of that, uh, the beauty of the beauty of that is uh, that the window is all is a 24 hours. It used to be 30 days, which is amazing, mm-hmm. but now it's 24 hours where if anybody buys anything, off of the off of the Amazon off of Amazon, you get a commission off that as well. It's not just the specific product, mm-hmm. which is great, and that works for us. That works for anybody um, who has an affiliate relationship with Amazon as well. Is that once you start creating content, that archive is still going to be there. So a year from now, um, during Christmas when you're with your family, someone can stumble across your article and click the link and buy something for both that link or and something else and still give you that commission. So Amazon's a great one for that. And of course, there's going to be other partnerships. Um, um, others that I can suggest is Rakuten Affiliate Marketing. Uh, CJ Affiliate is another one. And another one that uh, um, most people sleep on is direct uh, relationships. Literally reaching out and saying, hey, does Canva have an affiliate relationship or affiliate marketing relationship? I search in Canva Affiliate on Google this company affiliate on Google and to see what comes up, you know, this can really get you started and get the ball rolling for you. So try those out. Let us know what you think. Um, and yeah, great. Create some business for yourself. Let's move right along. That was amazing, bro. I really enjoyed, uh, those tips, man. No really problem. did really did, man. But guys, 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 you know, what the time of the podcast it is, it's Mr. Hustle Muscle here, you know, Owen Osinde. 
ready to give you the hustle nation tip of the week. So I really thought about this right now and not right now, but over the past couple of days and a lot of the questions and a lot of the ways to really get in contact with someone. I think we live in a time right now where we're so digitally connected. We see a lot of people doing well. You can see them on LinkedIn. Uh, you have them on Instagram and you have a direct uh, access to these individuals, but you want to message them. You want to connect with them. You want to really get them to really give you advice or to spend some time with them just to, you know, get to know how they got to where they are and what you can learn from them. And if they can mentor you perhaps towards where you want to go. And a lot of people stumble on this because they see someone that they want to reach out to, but they don't know how to exchange value where they're getting value from that person. But how are you actually getting value? How are you giving value to that person who's giving you value, who you really look up to? So a lot of people, they get in the spot where they say, hey, let's go to a cup of coffee or let's let me let's sit down with you. I can pick your brain, quote unquote. Right. I, you know, sidebar. I actually really hate that term. Pick your brain. I mean, I'm a visual person. And I, when I picture that, I'm just like, raw. like that just looks kind of messed. But, you know, you come up, we come up with these certain things. But if you really look at that person that you're asking, can I get a cup of coffee with you? How many coffee requests do you think that they get in a week, in a month or on their LinkedIn inbox, their IG DMs? We had two guests here who spoke about this. You know, recently we had Edgar Brown, founder, CEO, co-founder and CEO of FitDrive. And we also had Swish Goswami, who we spoke about networking. And there's a pattern here because they are at a position where they're connected well with investors. They've been covered on different publications. They're really out here doing it. And one of the things that they uh, spoke about is giving value to the person you want to connect with. For, For example, Swish he was talking about meeting Michael Hyatt. You know, Michael Hyatt is like a big, uh, you know, business uh, person in Canada. Uh, You'd have Edgar Brown who, you know, he's like trying to connect with investors and connect with people who are in the industry. What can you really do to give them value? So Swish, he wrote an article, he interviewed Michael Hyatt, wrote a really nice piece about him. Um, Edgar Brown, he was the president at McGill for the Entrepreneurship Society. So he really sat there, really gave them a platform to speak. And now when they want to reach out to something, they know that, you know what, Edgar did this, Swish did this. So these are, the, these are examples I can think of where you can give value to someone that you want to get value from them. What can you do to get their attention that nobody else is doing? If you're an influencer, what can you give that influencer to get them to do something for you? If you are uh, in beauty and you want to connect with with someone in beauty, what can you do to help them uh, advance them so they can advance you? Maybe write a beauty PDF and how you can do a skincare routine. This is just for if you're in the beauty industry, but you get the point. You need to give something to get something. The era of coffees and doing it for charity, those days are long gone because people these days, they value their time more than anything. So there's no freebie. So you have to give to get back. And it's going to take some time, but you really got to suck it up and think about creative ways that you can actually form that relationship if you really want it. So you can have a long lasting relationship instead of it being like a 20, 30 minute coffee meeting and they forgot about you. So that's the message for this week. Think about ways you can give back to the person you want to get in contact with. One of the things we do right now is with the podcast uh, you know, it's been a great networking tool for us, you know, by accident, because, you know, we're talking to a lot of business people we find interesting and we're just doing it because we're curious to, to learn about them and how they got where they are. So by us doing that, you know, we're creating content, we're promoting them, we're giving to them and we're giving to their audience. And in return, in that process, we build a relationship So later on, if we want to go to lunch, we want to do anything else, the relationship is already built and we can, you know, build on top of that. So a podcast, a YouTube channel, uh, these different, a blog, whatever media platform you might have, these are good sources for you to build and leverage uh, a relationship with someone uh, by providing them with content, providing them with advice and solid, solid, um, 
you know, a solid method to really help them get you out there. So that is the hustle nation tip of the week. Remember your network is your net worth, but to get there, you have to be strategic on how you're going to build that uh, network. And that's the way to do it. Awesome, man. With that being said, let's hop straight into the pod. Hey guys, before we hop into the podcast, we have a few housekeeping announcements. For free to support the podcast, if you're on Apple, make sure you rate and write a review about our podcast. This makes a huge difference. On Instagram, make sure to take a screenshot and tag us in their Instagram stories. It makes a huge difference. It helps us share the podcast out and expand the community. On Twitter, we're at 247 Hustlers. And on Facebook, we're Hustle Over Everything. Guys, we were busting our ass, especially Owen, working on their weekly newsletter. It's called The 24-7 Hustle. It covers news in business, music, and culture, all through the lens of entrepreneurship. And for our paid options, guys, we have some great merch on the store. Check it out at hustleovereverything.co. And lastly, our Proud to Pay program is linked in the description down below. Now let's hop into the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited. We have Candicia John on the show. Candicia, welcome. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's going great. I'm excited to have you on the show. Yeah, we're yeah. very excited. Uh, no. talk, talk about the biz and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, honestly, I'm really excited to like speak to you guys. So I think this is going to be a really good interview. Yeah, so let's jump right in. So how did you start your influencer Toronto curly girl brand okay so basically I own um three brands but they all kind of stem from the same story um I went through a perm accident when I was younger around the high school age uh, where everybody was straightening their hair around that time and I was I permed my hair now come graduation photo time um, got my hair retouched and unfortunately, um, you know, my hair literally, like as we were rinsing out the perm, it was mm-hmm. literally dropping out like clumps. And oh. at first it was, a, yeah, like it was such a traumatic experience at first. But then I was like, you know what, like, what am I going to do to like, you know, try and, um, you know, get my hair back to what it was. And I started going to YouTube because at the time, like that's where all the DIY recipes were. That's where everything was. This was like before Pinterest was popping. And um, this is where like, I actually got a lot of my hair education and I started trying everything, trying things in my kitchen. And a lot of people started noticing that my hair would grow back really fast. And when they realized like, wait you actually have curly hair like what's happening um you know they asked me a lot of questions as to how I did it they wanted to do it at the time so like how could they do it and I basically built a platform off of that um so that's how like my influencing start and started and that's how um YouTube started and then for Toronto Curly Girl Meetup Um, it was a situation where I wanted to go to events as an influencer, but I noticed a lot of the bigger events like Essence Fest, uh, natural, uh, world natural hair show, um, all of those different events were in the States and it was expensive at the time for me to travel. Mm -hmm. So I really just asked my, my sister at the time, um, which she's also kind of acts as my manager as well. And I was like, honestly, I would love to go to an event, but I wonder if there's anything like that here in Canada. And we we did our research. There wasn't anything kind of in the market at the time. And I honestly just said, like, you know what? We should have our own event. And she's just like, I mean, why not? Let's do it. So we literally jumped into it that day. And we put on our first event in less than three months. So that's basically how Toronto Curly Girl Mito started. Talk to us about uh, the very first event, right? Mm -hmm. When you get that idea of having an event, how did you go on about planning this event? Yeah, so I mean, prior to that, like I had a tiny bit of experience in event planning because I did it as a summer job um, for the city of Peterborough. 
And I helped put on um, like a Caribbean street festival at the time, um, which was really an eye-opening experience for me. So I took a lot of that experience and I brought it into the event planning. So in order for us to host it, I knew we needed a platform. I knew we needed to connect with other women. Um, so we first went to Instagram and that was kind of a no brainer for us at the time. Like that was um, a big platform for my influencing. So we went there and we started our brand. Um, we got our logo done. We got our company registered. Um, and then we started looking for event spaces, which we looked locally um, in like the downtown area. And we actually found a great place through recommendations from um, friends on Instagram, honestly. Um, and then we started to put it out there through Eventbrite, um, which was a really easy platform for us to use to sell our tickets. And we got quite a bit of traffic just from being on there. And we, I think for attendance, we had about 60 people show up to the first event, um, which was a great turnout for us. But all the funding for that event literally came from our pockets. We didn't have any outside funding. We didn't take out any loans. Um, so this literally came from like what we already had um, from our personal funds and we just kind of flipped that into the event. Wow. Mm -hmm. you know, your, yourself is the, you started as the first bootstrapper, you know. For yeah, your yeah, basically. And I mean, like, it was such a humbling experience because at the time I knew I wanted to do this and I knew there was a passion behind it. And I was like, you know what, no matter what it takes at this point, I will try and like, you know, move things around and budget the way that I need to in order to make this event happen. And we had so much support um, from volunteers, um, again, like local people that we found on Instagram, like our photographer and things like that. Like, um, like people just really rallied and helped us um, for the first event, which definitely gave us a really good base for us to launch our second one. Now, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to throwing events is sponsors for that event. Yeah. Right? Uh, you got Sephora as well as mm -hmm. local talent, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what was the business model for that as well mm -hmm. as the process of reaching out to the big brands like Sephora and other brands that were there? Mm hmm yeah, so I'm going to be completely honest with you in terms of like a business model for the sponsorship. Um, it, I took a lot of it from like my influencing because for influencership, like you do a lot of pitching to brands. Um, so I kind of took my platform of like in drafts of how I formulate my emails and my media kits and stuff like that. And again, I translated that into that business. Mm. Um, the other thing that we did for that event in particular, we also worked with other um, outside um, sponsor, I guess, experts. Mm -hmm. um, and we worked with them and they kind of helped get us into contact with a few people. And, you know, that definitely helped and, and was a little bit of an eye opening experience. Would I ever do it again? I don't think so. Just because, again, like I know so much already from like being an influencer. But obviously there's room for growth and there's room for, for improvement. But I think the way that we moved in the second event for those sponsorships, a lot of it came from just literally meeting people, going to different events in Toronto and just being connected to the right people. So for Sephora in particular, um, my girl that actually, she's a manager at a local Sephora. And I met her at like a random event and we just like, she randomly took me home one day um, from that event and we were just talking and we figured out like what we did and we just connected that way. Um, so a lot of our business successes, I would honestly say like comes from interacting with people and meeting them at that humanistic level versus like, I just want your dollars. Um, which I find like that definitely got us a lot further in businesses, like versus again, like just asking people like, I need your money. <laughs> so one of the great things that you've done is, uh, you know, you've developed a community, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, curly hair is, you know, for example, me as a man, I mean, I've never thought about it, like, there be a community that exists about this. Mm -hmm. What is it that, that you think about? what is it that you think your fans and your followers and your attendees really love about the curly hair meetup? What is it that really gets them excited? And why is it a specific community for curly hair 
that other people might not know about that really makes it such a great community? Yeah, so I think um, what makes us really different is, again, like the connections that you make, like not just with us, but also with people in the community as well. Mm -hmm. We're quite open and safe space. Um, which I think a lot of people love, um, you know, having a place where they can call their own. Um, and we've kind of just allowed our audience to make it whatever they wanted it to be, um, which I think is what a lot of people are looking for in this type of community. Because there's so many different curls and everybody from, you know, all the different races and stuff, you can, we can all be connected under one thing. So I think like that's what we kind of, um, you know, honed in on is being uh, this inclusive group. Um, and I think on top of that as well, um, we just learned how to interact and have fun um, and realizing that, yes, you can have business models and structures and, you know, like really formulate your business to be like kind of like this beast of its own. Um, however, if you don't have the people to drive it and you don't have um, people loving and growing and having fun with it, it's really not going to go anywhere because really and truly we're, we're basically allowing our customers to help drive our business. Um, so again, like just allowing them that freedom, I think is what really brought a lot of people in and realized that this is a safe space for them. Awesome. Beautiful. But one thing you, you really mentioned that was great is creating a real community mm -hmm. for people who have curly hair or mm -hmm. who are like-minded essentially you know mm -hmm. and bring them on all under one umbrella it's kind of mm -hmm. like the general consensus i'm think i'm seeing am i right Ex exactly and i think i've kind of built that across all three of my businesses and again mm -hmm. being able to pour into each of them and have each of them kind of um outspill into each um, has definitely been such a big thing because they realize that there's not only just a community from our event, but there's a community on the apparel side, there's a community on the influencer side. So there's just a lot of safe spaces and there's a lot of things that people can pick and choose from. Definitely, definitely. So like um, getting, I want to get a little bit deeper into the event space. Like mm -hmm. uh, how much of your own, own money do you have to put into it in order to like, make, make that work? You know, like on average, would you say? Um, so like in terms of like monetary funds? Yeah. Uh, so in terms of money, um, what we put out at least for last year um, was probably around, I want to say like the 1500 to like almost 1700 ballpark. Right. Um, and that was for an event that hosted like 150 people. Um, and again, like there's probably things like we made mistakes on, which looking back, like we definitely spent more in some areas that we should have. Um, but yeah, around that ballpark is, is a safe number, at least for an event that size. Interesting. What was like the, the biggest cost? Was it like the actual um, space or was it, was it yeah, DJs I or something like that? Or? I mean, the, the event space itself was a lot of money. Um, and again, even after negotiation and stuff, there was not much wiggle room that we could have done. Um, mm. However, um, I want to say the other big one was host, like our host cost and our DJ cost. That was probably the other two. Being completely honest, though, like in the world of Spotify and Apple Music and things like that, um, I think again, this is kind of an unpopular opinion when it comes to events. I think if you have somebody who can do audio versus somebody who can be a DJ, you could probably save a, a stupid amount of money um, when it comes to um, at least that side of it, um, which I think at that point, um, again, like that's somewhere we could have saved for sure. Interesting. Interesting. So you're saying this have someone, this have the phone plugged in with the aux, um, <laughs> Because I mean, hey, tunes hey, are tunes, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And I mean, again, like, this is of, like, no offense to anybody in the, in the DA, DJ industry because, again, like, they, they have their thing. And, again, I've met some incredibly talented DJs over, like, you know, my businesses. But honestly, again, like you said, tunes are tunes. But at the same time, I find that 
every DJ has their own style. Mm -hmm. And depending as to whether that meshes with your audience, it meshes with their, their vibe and stuff like that is really important. Um, so kind of going through that with them when it comes to event planning is important. Um, and it's something that we overlook as event um, you know, planners as well. We don't really ask those questions. We kind of just hire out and then that's it. Whereas we really have to look at our audiences and we really have to look at whether it's going to fit our aesthetic or not. One of the best things to do to grow a community is nurturing a community, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for your, you know, curly girl meetup, you know, what are some things that you've done to nurture your community outside mm -hmm. of your events uh, mm -hmm. to, you know, to show them, to keep reminding them of your presence? Mm -hmm. So um, at least for this year, what we've done because of everything that's happening with yeah. COVID, um, we decided to really kind of ask our audience what they want from us next, which is really important because feedback is everything. Um, but secondly, we realized that a lot of people from past events, they really loved um, our marketplace um, aspect of our event, which is where local brands especially um from black owned businesses um we give them a platform during our event where they can sell out their products um so th some people really loved things like that but they didn't know like where to follow up with them they didn't know where to find them anymore or they like threw out the packaging so they don't remember um so to kind of create a space for that we made an e-commerce pl platform for that um, which I find like during that time, especially with everything that was happening with COVID, it was very, very important for us to do that. Um, so when we created that, um, at least we were able to tell the, our, at least our audience that there was something else for them and to help nurture them in that aspect. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So walk us through that. Like how you, I guess, plan to pivot, you know, that word you have been hearing a million times. <laughs> yeah. Pivot, pivot. <laughs> yeah. Pivot, pivot. Yeah. But yeah, um, how has that been going? Like, are you creating like a new website, more of like a virtual experience? Like, what do you, mm -hmm. let's, go, let's get into detail there. Yeah, so um, in terms of pivoting, I mean, that's been the name of the game, like you said, like for 2020, we've all had to pivot. Um, but to go from um, being in a physical space to an online space was huge for us because we realized, again, our biggest platform was Instagram. So to reach everybody in an online platform was really important for us. So we had a website built, um, which was an e-commerce website um, by a beautifully talented Black woman, um, which her name is Tiana. Um, so if you guys ever want to hit her up, like she's absolutely talented. Love her. Um, but she, yeah, so she created an e-commerce for us. And what we wanted to do was to basically create a, a, an online like central shop where we have multiple Canadian brands all under one roof where people can shop not only from Canadian grand, uh, brands, but also shop from female entrepreneurs, which is near and dear to our heart uh, because empowering other women helps empower us. So, um, you know, definitely investing in them was important. And um, again, like creating a space where our, our consumer, we took a lot of the guesswork out. So we created bundles, um, which again, for wash day, you have your shampoo, your conditioner, you have a whole bunch of products. And we wanted to, again, take out the guesswork out of it and um, create bundles so that our customer has everything that they need all in one platform. Oh, that's beautiful. So it's amazing, what, yeah. What platform is it on? Um, and like, how did you go about like, executing this? Yeah, I really want to go deeper because this is like a beautiful thing um, to like explain to the people. So like, when you're creating mm -hmm. it, did they, she design it on like a WordPress or Shopify? Yeah, so um, we actually did it on Squarespace, which was completely okay. brand new to us um, because our other brand, Curly Prince, is actually on Shopify. Mm -hmm. um, so Squarespace um, was a whole new platform for us, but then we took the time to learn it. And honestly, it was more geared towards what we wanted to do at the time. Um, so we decided to um, make that decision with our web designer. Um, and again, like to get the brands, um, you know, to be partnered up with us, we first started out with, um, kind of like cold calling, um, but we basically did it over DM, um, because a lot of the brands were already interacting with us on Instagram. So creating that interaction with them, um, and kind of asking them whether they were interested in an opportunity like this and then scheduling phone calls. Because I find that you can relay more on a phone call versus an email. And when you're emailing somebody, tone is different. 
Um, what you're kind of advertising to them is different. So everything about that is different. Um, so again, calling was something a little bit more humanistic, a little bit more personal, and it put a name to the face basically, um, which definitely helped us a lot with our success with getting um, more brands um, under our platform. That's amazing. So like how much brands are you at now? Like how's this, how's the rollout been? Yeah. So right now um, we rolled out with three brands, um, but right now we have another three in the works. Um, so we're hopefully going to have six in total um, at least by the last quarter of this year, which is going to be really exciting. Um, and again, like it's literally just connect connecting with um, people that we already have under like our TCGM uh, radar, but also through my influencership, because I've met with other, um, you know, with brand owners and some of my friends are brand owners, like reconnecting with them and seeing um, who is potentially in the place that they can partner with something like this. Solid, solid, solid. So one of the great things that you've done is uh, being able to build great brands, right? Mm -hmm. What are some elements that go into making a great brand and communicating that to your subgroup of customers that you have for your events and your online businesses as well? Um, so I want to kind of keep it to three things because I think those three things are very foundational. Um, one, you have to take the guesswork out because I think the more your, your customer and your consumer is asking questions, the less likely they are going to A, shop from you or B, interact with you. Um, if they aren't getting a clear image as to what you do and how you mm -hmm. do it and what you offer them, again, they'll go to the next person that can answer those questions. Um, so we take, again, a lot of guesswork out. It starts with, if again, you're on social media, your, your bio, specifically saying what you do, um, how you're going to execute, what you're trying to execute, and again, taking that guesswork out. Um, on your websites, one big thing that my sister and I, we always say, invest in your About Us page. I think that's like the most overlooked page on anybody's website. And it's not because we don't want to take the time. I think we're getting really hard on ourselves when, it's try when we try to describe our business and describe who we are. But you kind of have to own that as a business owner and you need to tell people what exactly you do. And again, like being confident in what your skills are. So then when you put it in your about us page, I can clearly depict what you do. And I know a sense of who you are. So, you're so yeah, mm -hmm. you're so right. Like, and I think as well to a lot of uh, businesses, they're afraid to get personal as well too. Yeah. Uh, the, the person behind the brand is also the brand as well too. So mm -hmm. without a Candicia, like, there's no brand so communicating exactly. the builder is what the founder is about what their core beliefs values and uh mm -hmm. you know why they started the business i also think that's very important because it's it allows you to really communicate the brand in a way that no other person can describe it for you right and a mm -hmm. lot of people shop with people they trust so when you actually communicate mm -hmm. those values uh why you started it people actually connect with you on a deeper level because they're attracted because they're another Candicia. They can say, oh, I mm -hmm. see Candicia in myself. So mm -hmm. I'm so with you on that. And uh, Alex and I also invested in our About Us page. We really told a solid story about us. Our faces are there. So people mm -hmm. know there's actually a face behind this website. We can actually exactly. contact these guys. We can find them on IG. It's because before it was just like a hustle over everything logo before we really did that. So you're so right on that. 100%. Yeah, I know. Yeah, like I definitely agree with you guys. And it's definitely comes down to, like you said, putting a face to the brand, um, which I actually had like a really good conversation with um, our team member. And I told her, I was like, honestly, for our brand to be successful, they need to know who they're speaking to. And a lot of people, because of the way that social media was created, it keeps us at a distance in a sense. Um, so we're not actually um, really investing in the person. But once we start to reinvest back into that, like you said, there's trust there, there's communication there. Um, and then you can pour so much love into your brand and your audience can actually feel and see that. Um, which I always say to you, like even in my daily life, if people can be treated like people and they can be treated the way that you want to be treated, that takes you so much farther in life versus 
you being treated as an object or a number or as a dollar sign. It will always translate to somebody feeling um, very important or very special. And that's where we take a lot of our customer service. Um, and that's one of our, um, you know, one of our highlights of our customer service. So for example, we just had a client, um, well, a customer, and she wanted to order from Curly Prints, which is our apparel company. Now we already sold out in our smaller sizes and we made a decision that we were no longer going to stock restock the new sizes because summer's almost ending and our summer designs, we wanted to sell it out completely. So that was a business decision. However, she sent us an email saying that she wanted, um, you know, smaller sizes because she wants to gift this to a friend and her friend was really looking on her website and they really wanted to order, but they really don't have the funds to do so. So she was actually going to buy it for her. So after hearing her story, um, again, circling back to our team, I was like, you know what, let's do this for her because it's important to her. It's important to her friend, which makes it our business. It's our importance as well to make sure that she feels loved and her friend feels loved and appreciated. So we circled back to her and we told her that we were going to restock. So, um, you know, we'll make one available for her. And we added an extra card so then she can write like her little special gift to her friend. Um, so then again, we're taking the guesswork out of it. Um, which she was so appreciative of that, that she's now a repeat customer. So again, like those little things of going above and beyond in your business and showing that love and kindness, again, is a huge part of why um, a lot of, at least for my businesses, we've been so successful. That's amazing. Let's uh, take a quick break and be right back. All right, guys, and we're back. Let's jump right back in. <laughs> so we were talking about, you know, uh, your customer service and the way you really went over to surprise and delight this customer. Now they're a returning customer. You know, we're actually <laughs> thinking about that um, with our business. You know, um, we're actually about to write a letter to um, our first customer just to say like a thank you card, just to say, hey, we really mm. appreciate buying our and supporting our merch which you can get on our website hustleeverything.co you know Ooh, okay okay check out okay the sweater, you know? it's great that we're all repping our brands you know can you see got the know. curly gang sweater there you that. know and we got the so supportive <laughs> <I like. laughs> you know we got the hustle and flow designs on the crew neck and the snapback so it's great mm. you know no it's that's snappy. great that's awesome i'm so happy for you guys honestly Oh, thank you so much. You've seen us. You were with us from day one, Candicia. You've seen us. You're like uh, yeah. one of our early supporters. Yeah. No, honestly, like it's so amazing to see when brands like grow and develop. And especially like when it's your friends too, you're kind of like cheering on the sideline. You're like, keep going. It's okay. <laughs> but no, like honestly, it's been really amazing to watch you guys grow though. Most definitely. Man, I'm just going to say this. Like if you see one of the things we're trying to do right now, if we pull one of these things off, ooh, man, man. Oh, those and, ain't ready. They're oh, not man. ready. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> man, they actually just got the email too. You only see the email? I just want to document it and, and have it on on recording as it, because it just came in. You know what I'm saying? We'll oh, talk, from we'll Mullings, talk, eh? We'll talk, yeah, from Mullings. Oh, yeah, shout out to David Mullings. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, yeah, that be, oof. We'll, I'll, we'll tell you offline. We'll tell you offline what you what we yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, no, of course, of course. All right, so let's jump back in now. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I want to take a bit, bit of a pivot. You know, you talked about being a good business person, um, giving customer mm -hmm. service, but uh, some mm -hmm. of the things that you really had to work on was overcoming like personal hurdles, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one thing that was a bit tough that I know um, we slightly covered before was um, like breaking up with your fiance, right? Mm -hmm. How did that affect your business? Did that affect you and how'd you get over it? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, obviously at first, like such a serious relationship, um, you know, coming out of that is quite traumatic let's let's just put it that way um yeah. it was somebody who i've known and loved for years um definitely a part of my life definitely a part of like the growth um but really and truly it, it took it took me in a place that i never 
thought I would ever be in. Um, and I mean, in terms of like that mental darkness, I think the last time I've ever experienced something like that was actually when my dad got into a really bad car accident. And I think that was about, now it's going to be like eight or nine years ago. Um, but ever since then, that was probably the darkest moment of my life. And then this one was probably like a close second, a close second to that. Um, and being completely transparent, it definitely took me out of the game for a bit. Um, I took a pause off of, um, you know, YouTube. I took a pause off of, you know, doing everything social because A, I was really trying to figure out like who I was and um, redefine myself outside of a relationship. But on top of that, having the stress of, again, going through something so traumatic. And then at the time, we were trying to start um, my apparel company. And it was such beautiful timing now that I look at it. But back then, it was terrible timing because, again, I couldn't get my head straight. Um, my, my heart and my brain was not in it. And I felt like I was literally dragging myself every single day to try to make that business work. And I couldn't. I couldn't do it. So um, I definitely, like my friends started noticing, my family started noticing that, you know what, like you're slipping. Um, and by slipping, I mean, like I was literally like in bed for like 14 hours a day. Like I was just, I was in a whole different headspace versus where I am now. And it's literally like a light went off. Um, but what pulls me through is I had to tell myself that my businesses are not about me, they're about somebody else. And if I can make somebody else's day, even though I'm going through my worst period of my life, I have to try. I, I had to, because I really had to look outside of myself and realize that again, like my businesses aren't for me. Um, none of it is for me, if you really think about it. It's really just for the people who I serve. And there was, I knew there was someone out there that would appreciate this. And because I, I knew that I had to, again, take myself out of that mental darkness at times and try to make that work. That's crazy. I, I'm, first and foremost, I'm sorry to hear that you went through that dark period. Um, the thing about dark periods is like a lot of people go through them and you can see them go through it and you're like, okay, you know what? That's just a separation it happens mm. but i've noticed it even with friends family like they'll be going through things and be like man just snap out of it just mm. but you gotta be you gotta be sympathetic you gotta be understands like mm -hmm. if i was in that position i'll probably feel the same way and if someone told me you know what just get out of that state yeah. of mind it's it's hard so it i is. totally sympathize with you because you know i have close people who have gone through similar downfalls and it, it can be just, it, it looks like a simple event from the outside or oh, it's just a breakup, like move on, but yeah. it hits you different. And when it hits you, you don't even know how to bounce back from it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, um, you know, what definitely helped was focusing on my mental health. And at the time, um, you know, I went back to a really good friend of mine who, um, I mean, is my therapist, but she's also considered as a family friend now. Um, just because through the experience of, um, you know, my dad's accident and stuff, I relied on her a lot. Um, and she's professionally in that space as well. But, um, you know, we reconnected and, you know, speaking to her again after a situation like this was so helpful. Um, and I still keep her up to a day like today. And I mean, like, obviously, we're human, we have our, our ups and our downs, and not everything is as fluid as we would like it to be. Um, but at the same time, just having somebody who I can vent to somebody who um, understands my personality being with me for so long. Um, you know, it's definitely helped me navigate through those spaces and really redefine myself as a single woman, but also as a full woman in the sense that because of out of that relationship, I don't see myself as a half. I don't see myself as, um, you know, somebody who has half of things that I can offer. I offer way more now versus, um, you know, when I was in the relationship and not to say that relationships, you know, diminish you, but at the time I really didn't know who I was. I really didn't own up to who I am and what I brought to the table. So now that I am, and I'm starting to learn that, um, I consider myself as a full woman versus, you know, half of the woman that I was before. Oh, that's beautiful. 
Mm-hmm. What were some of the things that they try to like teach you to bring you up to being a full woman? Um, I think a lot of it had to do with um, really naming what you're feeling. Um, and really, instead of saying like, for example, like I feel sad, why? And what happened? And where do you think that stems from? Asking yourself those personal internal questions. I mean, sometimes takes people for a little bit of a spiral, which I'm guilty of that because I'm like, I wonder what childhood trauma I went through that like got me to this point. But <laughs> at the same time, like, you know, those Relatable. questions are important though. They're so important because it really redefines how you look at your adulthood. It really looks um, redefines how you look at other people. Because, I mean, as sad as this is to say, sometimes I'm like, honestly, some of us were just shallow people having shallow conversations. And until we get to the really nitty gritty of why we do what we do and what we're motivated by, we never really answer those full questions in life at all. We just kind of go through it and say, meh, it's whatever, like, meh, it was another relationship. But really and truly, again, owning that pain and owning why I was in that pain, um, was something that we really focused on. And I think, again, really redefining who I was because outside of that, um, you know, really serious relationship, um, you know, being kind of transparent and telling on myself, um, I've been in so many relationships back to back to back to back to back. And I never gave myself a break and I never gave myself, um, you know, time to figure myself out. And I always gave myself the excuse like, well, I'm a social person. I love to like interact with people. I love to talk. So why shouldn't I not be in a relationship? But then that was, I realized has damaged me after every single time I did that. And then I left that relationship, not because of what he did, um, but simply what I did to myself. I left myself so damaged because of that, because I realized I was giving and giving and over giving to the point that I couldn't even give to myself. And by the end of it, I was so exhausted that I truly couldn't even look at myself and really define like who I was. Um, So again, really taking that time out for myself this time around and really trying to ask myself, who is Candicia outside of relationships? Um, How do I define myself? What kind of narratives do I tell myself? What kind of messaging do I put out out there for other people to see about me has been things that I've been focusing on. And I think those things have definitely helped redefine me in my business, but also in my personal life. You know, um, now that you are this full woman, like what are the differences mm-hmm. you're doing to like really mm-hmm. make more changes? Is it the customer service? Is it like the way you go about getting business? Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to the business side of things, yeah, it's, it's literally, like I, I pointed out before, it's literally treating people the way that I would like to be treated. And it's not even, um, you know, like how I like to be treated specifically, like in terms of like how I like to be interacted with, but simply feeling like somebody cares. Mm-hmm. And I, I really taken that um, into my business ventures. And again, like really trying to define that as a highlight of my business. Because again, a lot of people can do apparel. A lot of people are doing that, that type of stuff. Or a lot of people are doing events and have been really successful for that. So I really tried to had to figure out what makes my business special. And while kind of doing that self journey, I did that journey in my business as well. And I was like, you know what, if we can highlight that and we can make create like create safe spaces and make people feel loved and appreciated then maybe that's our specialty. And it doesn't sound miraculous. It doesn't sound like a business model. It doesn't sound like, you know, I got a whole bunch of dollars, um, you know, sponsored behind my name, but simply it's again, something enough that my customers feel loved and wanted, which is important. Most definitely, most definitely. Um, So putting a button on like uh, this going forward, any advice for our listeners? Um, so I would say for, you know, the, the young man or the young woman who's listening to this, and if you really wanted to start a business, I mean, A, you really need to be clear as to why you're doing what you're doing. Um, if it's simply to make a quick dollar or to, or flip a coin, um, 
I mean, if that's what you want to do, then sure. But I think for longevity and for, um, you know, success, I think that really comes down to why you do what you do. And it has to be linked to a passion. It has to be linked to something you truly love and something you will never get tired of. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean the admin stuff and the taxes and whatever. It simply is serving. And if you love serving others and you're willing to put down your own, um, you know, your own intentions for somebody else, then I think you can definitely make your business a, a longevity and a successful one. Um, the next thing I would say is to simply start. Um, a lot of my businesses, it literally was a less than a day of thinking and I started. Um, didn't know where it was. I didn't know. I didn't do no market research. I didn't do none of the background work that a lot of no offense business coaches will tell you. I did none of that. Um, and it's not simply to say that could have, um, you know, launched me into a whole different category. But again, I just knew what I wanted to do. And I knew I had the skills and the passion and the people to help me behind me. So I did it anyway. Um, so I think, again, it's just simply a matter of starting. And again, investing in your customer service is so important. And I think, again, that's where you get those repeated customers and you get that revolving door um, is simply making people feel like they're loved and appreciated. And that's what gets people coming back every time. I quickly want to add on to that because um, I 100% agree. In the uh, Christina podcast, we talked about GoDaddy and how GoDaddy services actually aren't all that great. But because mm. the customer service is so good, exactly. people come back time and time and time again. Like GoDaddy will sit there with you on the phone and just like, yes. I remember this one guy, he told me there's this one domain I had. I think I still own it, but it's like, uh, B stock, Alex. Remember when I launched B stock about mm -hmm. a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and I wanted to use it, and he's just like, "Man, that's such a solid domain. I think you should keep it. Um, I think you should renew it or something like that." I was like, "I can help you get it back." And the way he helped me with it, he just conversed with me, kept mm -hmm. it real with me. It felt like I was talking to a friend. He's just like, "Man, mm -hmm. it'd be crazy to give this up, man." So, what mm -hmm. I can do, I can give you like this discount. You can get it back. Think about it, sit on it, you know, maybe a project will come out of it, you know, whatever, yeah. but this is like a great domain. You can sell it for like, you know, several hundreds of dollars, close to a thousand dollars, he said. Wow. And, um, yeah. So he's one of those guys who just, GoDaddy is A1 in my books. Uh, yeah. That's why I always purchase everything through them. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And sorry to cut you short, Alex, but, um, you know, even our first Curly Prince website was actually on GoDaddy. And like you said, in terms of what they offer versus Shopify and Squarespace, I mean, they're a little lagging behind if we're going to be completely honest. Mm -hmm. However, like you said, their customer service, I was just bewildered. And I was just like, how is it that customer service is staying on the phone with me for that long? And they're not like sounding like they had the most terrible day. Yeah. Like I was just like, wow, like they yeah. actually really invest in that. And like you said, that's their highlight though. And that's what's made them so successful is because they've highlighted on the fact that their people behind the phone actually care and they put that time in. And again, if that's where you need to shine in your business, because, you know, like everybody else is doing the same thing as you, I don't see why not. Because again, you ha may have somebody else that's looking for that in another business and it may just be you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. So, um, oh, go ahead, Owen. Are you yeah. switching up or, or yeah. should I get my, my piece out? Oh, you're giving a P. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, GoDaddy. I have a question I want to ask her. It's, it's completely different from GoDaddy. All right, so let me put a button on my thing because uh, with your example with GoDaddy and Shopify, man, I was actually on uh, on the phone with Shopify and mm. it took them an hour to answer their phone. An hour. Tragic. An hour? An Yo. hour. A literal I, hour. Oh, my Who God. Who has I, time to sit on the phone for that long? Oh, my I, goodness. Alex, take this in. Uh, even even, uh -uh. even talking about the thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh so for our banking we use stripe on the website right mm -hmm. and the money like has been stripe has been trying to like deposit the money into our account but something's going on with them so i'm like okay let me switch to shopify payments which will be easy and seamless yeah so i get on shopify i'm chatting with the customer service and um 
before when I was using this website for something else, I was using it for drop shipping and they didn't allow to use Shopify payments for drop shipping. Yeah. So uh, they banned me from using Shopify payments. So the no. website H- hustle over everything is using right now was like a different dropship website before I pivoted to hustle over everything about a year, a year back. So the guy tells me I can't use Shopify payments because I don't follow the rules. And once you get banned, you can't even appeal it anymore because once you're banned, you're banned. I'm like, okay, buddy, look, I'm using it for a different, the website's mm-hmm. a different, completely different thing. We're using Printful, we're using whatever, it's nothing, whatever. Then he tells me, yeah. if you want to start, you shop five payments, start like another website. And I'm like, how are you going to tell me to start another website after doing all this work and all this stuff on it to start wow. a different website? Like, like to have the presence of mind to tell a wow. customer, oh, just start your website again all over, regard everything you've done on it and just start a different account. And I'm like, really? Just to start Shopify payments? This was yesterday. I had to leave a poor review on their customer service. I was like, this guy, Zach, totally messed me up. Yeah, and no, me. This, that, this is Friday that's night. That's terrible. Yeah. Damn. It's my first time hearing it too. That's insane. Bro, I know. I don't wow. know how I didn't tell you this. I was so vexed. Like, it's like, oh yeah, man, you you know, you, you can't use Shopify payments because you got banned. I'm like, okay, let me appeal it because you can take a look at everything. You definitely know who our supplier is, you definitely know what we're doing. Just let us use Shopify payments. Like, well, they're pretty tough on Shopify payments. If you get banned, you get you don't get access again. I was like, wow, really? Wow. So what am I gonna do? Is like, oh I mean, you can uh and I can when I read his statement, I can read his voice too. I can hear his voice in my head. He's like, uh, well, you know, I mean, all you can do is just like, you can, you can start like another website, dude. Like, I mean, like, it's totally easy. I mean, I'm like, bro, like, <laughs> you, so you see the word, no problem. yes, like oh. how just to use Shopify payments, I got to start another site. Okay. Yeah. Let me not get amped up here, but that, that was one thing I got to let you guys know, man. Damn. Shopify. That's crazy. Yeah. Honestly, if I heard that, I would be, I would be like, yo, listen here. I put too much blood, sweat, and tears into this first website. So what you going to do is exactly. going to give me that website that, and that payment on top of that. Maybe for a child run for free. Maybe. maybe <laughs> give me just three maybe. months free. Give me three maybe. months free on my Cause. subscription. Yeah, that's insane. Jeez, wow. Oh, well, well, one thing I want to quickly add to um, is for Stripe. You know, I'm on Stripe mm-hmm. for my agency um, with media. And mm-hmm. one thing I realized is that for the first payment, the first few payments, like the process is long as hell. Like, is I think it, it took, actually? It took like, like, like eight to 10 business days for the first payment. Mod. It mod. I think that they're, they're going through some kind of like background check yes. or some shit. I don't know what it is. Oh, yeah. But, but they do like oh. verification checks and everything. Yeah, all yeah. types of crit- stupidness with you. And it goes through some, it must be Mac Manly or if you do something like that. So wow. this is for the listeners, like that's one thing. If you're ever on Stripe and you think or considering PayPal, Stripe, whatever, whatever, um, that's one thing to really take into consideration. The first payment is a long time. Then after that, it's well, like a business day. It's pretty good after that. Or even sometimes okay. like in the day. Mm-hmm. But yeah, um, that's all the thing <laughs> yes. I was to add. Lastly, FreshBooks has a customer service so good that it has a local number, a 416 number for Torontonians. And they answer the phone really? when you call. Wow. Yeah. I just wanted to add that because I never had that customer service. If anyone is ever thinking about running yes. a business, make uh, something like that is like next level that, you know, is super impressive that you always get recurring customers just for that one thing. Exactly. So uh, Alex, you're a big fresh books like like no nah, he <laughs> is fam like i remember the event that we ended up popping up at at the same time oh, yeah. the fresh book one. wow alex don't tell alex, me you met like, dc at fresh books too so <laughs> kill me. No, we met at fresh books so so it's no. hilarious so i think i've probably had like what five people on the, the podcast from fresh books mm-hmm. um because it's funny you actually met Kadesia and eden the same night at fresh books actually i think mm-hmm. i was with Kadesia. And I yeah. left Kadisa to speak with Eden. And now uh, look at that. We're both on the pod. Hey, uh, look at that. Look at that. Fresh Brook, Fresh Brooks is a place to find guests, man. I Fresh. guess so. I Shout guess yo, to, uh, like Fresh Brooks is really just connecting people. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to I make a living. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but yeah, all right. So now 
let's let's, let's wrap it up. Let's talk towards wrapping up. Oh, I'll ask you a question. Don't don't let me cut you off. Oh yeah. So yeah. Uh, one thing as we're wrapping it up, like, what is your vision moving forward? You know, you've painted us like uh, your whole process, what you do, how you do it, and why you do it moving forward in this uh, new era that the world is shaping out to be. Uh, what's your vision for your business? Wow. Um, honestly, I dream big. Um, when it comes to Toronto Curly Girl Meetup, I tell people I want us to be the beauty con of Canada. That's that's just simply it. That's where mm-hmm. I see us. Um, and it's their scale. It's their visibility. It's their presence. It's how they dominate like each side of the market because they also have, um, I think they're a private um, company now where they have like shareholders and stuff. So like even in that aspect too like that's where i see um toronto curly girl meetup like i see us in every province being represented um i see us again like expanding our e-commerce so we're basically like the sephora for hair brands like i see i see big things i see big things for us um and definitely looking into the near future i'm not going to say when but we are going to be expanding to other cities and stuff as well. So that's something huge for us. It's something that, again, we want representatives in each um, of the major provinces. So to dominate Canada right now is it's our big thing. Um, for my influencer um, stuff, I'm going to be completely honest. I've taken a back seat on it just because the businesses have taken a whole turn of their own. Um, so it's been really hard to manage. Um, but for right now, definitely getting more consistent with my YouTube channel is um, one of my nearer goals. And I think for right now, especially with Shea Moisture that just came across the border, um, I have speculations and heard that on Jackie's, which is another um, natural hair brand, they're trying to come over the border as well as more of those big um, natural hair brands that we love from the States are coming over to Canada, I want to be their go-to person um, that they come over and they partner up with um, to introduce the Canadian landscape. Um, So that would be huge for me. Um, Definitely partnering up with other brands and stuff is obviously important. Um, But I think for, um, for Curly Prince, the way I see us, I want us to be a household name. I want there to be an, an item for each member of the family. Like right now we have women's, we have unisex, which we're going to try and pivot into the male sector sooner. Um, but, you know, even having a kid's collection, expanding that, I think getting it out to um, other influencers and stuff so we can get our brand out there is going to be important for us. Um, We're actually growing great relationships for local retailers. So we have our stock in um, local um, beauty hair supply stores and also hair salons. So if you are in the Toronto area, you can go to Urban Curls, which is a hair salon. We also sell our products there. Um, And we have a few more here in the GTA in the works. Um, But yeah, definitely looking into, you know, being in physical stores, maybe our own store of our own would be kind of sick. So those, those things is what I dream for us. And I don't think it's not attainable for us. It's just a matter of timing and planning. Sounds good. Sounds good. It's a beautiful vision. It's looking great. Thank you. Thank you. And again, like it it all comes from support. And honestly, like I just want to give a really quick shout out to my sister. I know it's like, ah, it's cute. But um, but no, like she's been my ride or die. I mean, in life, but also in business. Like I do all of my businesses with her. Um, Again, she is the co-owner of Toronto Curly Girl Meetup. And she's also the co-owner of um, Curly Prince, the um, our our, um, apparel company. So again, like really big shout out to her because honestly, she is the backbone, the brain, like she's literally everything for this business when I'm not available and when I'm sleeping, um, she's there for me and she, she keeps it down. So definitely shout out to her for making, you know, these businesses and my dreams and our dreams come true. Most definitely. Definitely. Uh, with that being said, that wraps up the podcast. Hustleeverything.co at 24-7 Hustle on Instagram. DM us your thoughts, what you think of the podcast. And guys, hustle every day.